Hello, my name is Dr. Tom Bennett from the Battleship, New Jersey and the Kane University Oral History Program. Today is September 19th, the year is 2008. We're aboard the Battleship, New Jersey in Camden, New Jersey. Today, uh, one of the ship's reunions, I'm interviewing Mr. Frank, Mr. Fred L. Adams, Jr. of uh, Fishers, Indiana, who served aboard the battleship from 1943 to 1946 uh, in the deck division. Um, Mr. Adams, thanks so much for talking to us today. Thank you. Tell us, let's start off the conversation. How did you get involved with the Battleship New Jersey? Well, I enlisted in the Navy uh, when I was still 16. My father sound, signed for me. I spent my 17th birthday in the boot camp, uh, celebrated it. And uh, at the boot camp, I went into general detail and uh, was shipped over to Philadelphia, and I was assigned to the USS New Jersey, which was still being worked on at the time in the okay. shipyard. What made you? Uh, what made you enlist in the Navy? Well, I had two cousins who were in the Navy. One was a destroyer sailor, and uh, the other one was on a light cruiser. And I had to be in the Navy because they were in the Navy. And uh, so I quit school. And uh, I later earned my degree in, in high school. Uh, I quit school in 1942. And uh, I got my diploma then in 1949. Now, did many other young men at the time quit school? And I assume you're in Indiana at the time? Yeah. Did many other young men quit school? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was a patriotic thing to get in the service and, you know, and do your thing. And, uh, but I, I uh, when I was shipped over to Philadelphia Navy Yards, the first time I seen the ship, I had never seen a ship before in my life. And the first time I seen the ship, I was standing on the dock with a, all the other sailors waiting to go aboard May the 23rd, 1943. And I seen this big steel wall beside me and I didn't realize that that was the bow of the New Jersey at the time. When we went aboard the ship and uh, we had to go through the ceremony to commission the ship in May of 43. And uh, I was assigned to the 4th Division, the 5-inch Gunnery Division. And uh, at that time, we were uh, apprentice seamen. And uh, later, I obtained the rank of seaman first class, but I never got to be a petty officer. And uh, But I uh, was assigned to the 5-inch guns and I was a trainer on Mount 8. Uh, that made the turret go back and forth, you know. And uh, Where was Mount 8 located? Sir? Mount 8 was located, uh, it was a, let's see, there was, uh, was on the port side, aft of midships, and uh, it's the only mount left uh, on the port side uh, aft because of the missiles they put on. They took Mount 10 out. But um, we, uh, well, we had 13 men in the turret. And uh, then there was another group of men in the handling room down below. And uh, we had some good times. We what? had. Now, by the way, what was the morale of the crew like when everybody came aboard, the ship is commissioned, and it's getting ready to go to the Pacific? Well, when we all come aboard, we probably had maybe, uh, there was a total of about 2,700 people. We probably had 700 people who were Navy personnel from years past who was, you know, officers and that, and uh, old bosun mates and, and chief petty officers. Most of us kids, probably 2,000 of us, 
didn't know boo about the Navy. All we knew was we went through boot camp and we were trained in uh, to, you know, march and do calisthenics and whatever and, and uh, do Navy stuff. And so we all had to be trained. And uh, the morale was good on the ship. Yeah, it was really good. And, uh, you know, we trained on the guns. We were sent to gunnery school. And, and uh, then when we did leave the docks and go out for uh, our shakedown cruise, um, when we did a lot of gun practice in the Chesapeake Bay and then uh, we come back to the Philadelphia Navy Yards and then we went out again and we went up to a cold water run up around Newfoundland and, and uh, uh, we got some liberty in um, Portland, Maine and uh, uh, then we came back to the Philadelphia Navy Yards again and uh, I remember there was a British battleship on the other side of the pier in Philadelphia Navy Yards. I forget the name of it, but uh, then on the other side of us was the French cruiser Montcalm. And uh, every morning at muster, we would have to stand at attention on deck. They played the British God save the king, and we'd stand at attention for that. Then the French would play the Mar what La Marseille, their national anthem, and then we did our national anthem. And then when that was all over, then we went back to our quarters and did our thing. But uh, after that, we left. Now, before you go on, when you were training in the five-inch gun crew, <clears throat> What problems did you have to overcome to make sure your gun crew operated efficiently? What, what problems did you run into? How did you solve those problems? Just It was just a matter of um, each man was trained to do his particular job. Um, you had to know other jobs in the tour. Um, we had a pointer, made the guns go up and down, and we had the trainer. We had two men in there that was set the fuses on the uh, projectiles. Then we had two first loaders. They they lifted the five-inch shell into the tray. Then we behind them there was a powder man. Each gun had a powder man. Then each gun had a gun captain, and then they had also a hot shellman, which caught the hot powder case when it came out of the gun after it was fired and threw it outside. And uh, then we also had uh, a mount captain. In all total, there was 13 men manning two guns in a turret. And uh, each man had to practice and practice to do his job well and do it fast. And uh, we could fire maybe 20, 22 rounds a minute in five inch shells. Was it crowded in there? Oh, it was very crowded. And it was hot. hot and smoky. And uh, we had a bucket for um, to use as a toilet in the mount. And um, it was sealed up, no air. They shut the air down during battle. It was quite a thing. So during battle, they would shut the whole turret down and the uh, the blower system would be shut down? Oh, yeah. Real? Why would they shut the blower system down? Well, I'm not really sure about that, but uh, uh, I, I can't answer that. I, I don't know, but they, they shut down the blower system. So how many hours could you be in this turret and how, how hot do you think it would get? Well, I remember one time we stayed in the turret for three days. We were under constant air attack, and we stayed in the turret for three days. Is that the Marianas turkey shoot? That was one of them. And, uh, uh, let's see, o Okinawa was bad. Okinawa was really bad. And uh, there was so many suicide planes. 
after everybody. Why don't you talk about Okinawa a little bit? Um, well, it's... <clears throat> we supported the landings, and we were there to protect our aircraft carriers and uh, make sure that the boys got on the beach and secured, you know, the Marines. And... and uh, but we were on, uh, we were in constant air attack from the suicide planes, and uh, I forget just how long we were in Okinawa. Now I remember we had to leave Okinawa for a while because of a hurricane, our torrent, what do you call it, uh, typhoon, and we were in that typhoon for several days, and uh, then we went back to Okinawa. And uh, we were also in another typhoon uh, in the Philippine Sea off the uh, Philippines. And um, we lost three destroyers in that storm, just literally swamped them and sunk them. Gary, what was the, the power of that typhoon like aboard the battleship? The, the, uh, that was the um, November, I think, 1944 typhoon, where the three ships are sunk, three destroyers. Um, <clears throat> I, all I can remember is there was waves over 100 feet high at one time. The ship was, let's say the ship would roll to port and you could look out and see waves probably almost 100 feet high. And uh, then you would roll back to starboard and then you would pitch forward and then you'd pitch back and it was just a constant motion of forward, back, port, starboard, and it was pretty rough. It was pretty rough. Did many people get seasick? Oh, yeah. I never did get seasick, though. I never did. But um, the waves, the water would wash over the decks from uh, plowing under the, the bow would plow under the waves and wash it down through the decks, and it actually would tear the guns out of the deck, the 20 millimeters. That's why I wanted to ask, was there any damage to the ship after the uh, the typhoon? Oh yeah, they, they, they would just just tear the guns right out of the deck, the, the waves. Water is a very powerful thing. Did you actually lose some of the guns over the side? You know, I can't remember. I can't remember. Uh, we, uh, we had a hell of a lot of guns on the ship then. I think we had, uh, well, we had the 16s, you know, and we had the 25 inch guns. I believe we had 80, 40 millimeters. And if I'm not mistaken, I think we had maybe 120, 20 millimeters. By the way, back to the um, battle at Okinawa. What stays best in your mind from that battle? You're in your, your gun turret for almost three days, you said. What stays in your mind about that battle? Well, mail call, mail call. All division mail today, officers, leader, post office, pick up mail. mail I, mail uh, call. I think the one thing that sticks in my mind is the people jumping off the cliffs. The Japanese people, they were told that uh, the Marines would eat their babies and whatever, you know, and, and they were literally jumping off the cliffs and into the ocean, into the rocks down below. And the bodies were floating around in the bay. It was a terrible thing to you see. You actually saw some of the bodies floating by? Oh, yeah. By. And how, far, how far offshore was the battleship New Jersey from Okinawa? Oh, we were coming in pretty close. Uh, I would say maybe a couple hundred yards. But uh, I remember there was one Jap soldier that was floating around, and he didn't have a head just a long piece of skin coming off his neck and he was in full uniform and it was bloated, you know. They had to go out and win a motor whale boat and stick him in order to sink him. Because his body had bloated up with gas, I guess. Yeah. Was floating. Yeah. Um, what was the attitude of the crew towards the Japanese? Uh, not Japanese civilians on Okinawa, but Japanese Navy, Army, Marines, and so on like that. Oh, well, we... I could tell you a story about Admiral Halsey. It pretty much sums up what we felt about the Japs. 
we had picked up a, we shot down a Jap plane. We rescued the pilot, brought him on board the ship. They washed him down with a saltwater hose and he get, was given a bar of soap and he had to wash his head and everything. Then they shaved his head. The barber shaved his head and then they give him a clean pair of dungarees and a clean shirt and a pair of white sneakers with no strings in them. Then they marched him over to the starboard side of aft of, uh, of the superstructure, just just a little past uh, turret three. And Admiral Halsey was standing up on the superstructure deck above him. And he yelled down to the Marine that was guarding the Japanese pilot. He says, tell that Jap son of a bitch to look up there to me. And the Marine stuck his gun under his chin and lifted his head up. And Admiral Halsey proceeded to berate him and say, you no good son of a bitch. And he cussed him out and old Jap should be dead. And that's the way Admiral Halsey was. He, he just got going. And, and uh, that pretty much sums up how we felt about the Japanese. What I, was it, do, you, do you recall the expression on the Japanese pilot's face? Yeah, he was frightened. Yeah, he was scared to death. And, uh, I mean, naturally, he'd be scared, but uh, he had no idea what was going to happen to him. But they took him and put him in the brig and gave him ice cream. <laughs> he must have been happy for that. Yeah. Now, you also participated in the Mariana Turkey shoot. Oh, yeah. Could you describe that to us, sir? Well, after, uh, after most of the Jap planes were destroyed, uh, our planes was, had taken off to go after the Jap carriers. And they come back in the dark, and they were all low on fuel, and they had to land in the ocean. They couldn't find a ship to land on our carrier. A lot of them had to ditch their planes. And I remember we had our big floodlights on, and we were searching the ocean for uh, down our own down pilots, to, and we'd go out and pick them up. And and uh, that's the one thing that sticks in my mind about how much we. Uh, we just threw caution to the wind on submarines and all that stuff so that we can save our pilots. Do you recall the Japanese attacking the ship during Mariana's turkey, turkey shoot? Well, they didn't get much get too far into on our ship. Uh, they tried, but we had such tremendous firepower that uh, any aircraft fire that Jap plane didn't have much chance to get now, on. Now, if you could, for the historical record, sir, could you describe what goes on inside the the five inch gun compartment when you're being attacked by Japanese airplanes and you're firing back at the 10 mile to five mile range, whatever it might be, what happens inside? Well, let's say we're under an air attack and uh, officer up in the director in the superstructure, he, he locks onto the target and he tells us down in the turret to match up we had pointers and dials, match up and shift to automatic. Well, we'd match up our dials and then throw it in the automatic and he controlled the turret then. And then they would say load and commence firing. And we would fire and fire and fire. We actually would, we would get the giggles. I mean, it was a bunch of damn kids and we didn't realize that what was no danger. We didn't think about that. But we would get so tired loading and firing these damn guns that we would actually get the giggles. And the, the turret was to be full of smoke from the shell fires. And uh, it was a relief for us to cease fire. You know, they could open the hatch and get a little air in there. And so most of the time when the firing's done, uh, it's being done automatically by the gunnery officer someplace pointing the, uh, the turret. Well, we had to load the guns and uh, the powder man would throw the powder in and the first loader would throw the shell in. The shell weighed about 58 pounds. Then he would hit a lever and it would shove 
both of them into the breach. And then when it hit the breach, the breach block would automatically come up and then it would, the director would pull the trigger and fire. And uh, then the breach would drop in the shell of the uh, powder case would come out and the man would catch it and throw it out a little hole in the back of the uh, turret. And, uh, uh, but that's the way it was in there. It was just, uh, it was just smoky and hot. And like I say, we would just get so tired of firing a gun, taking guns that we'd get, get giddy. Now, your job as a pointer was to point, I assume. No, I was a trainer. Trainer, and what would be, what did the trainer do? Well, I would bring the turret around and uh, I would match up the dials. The director's dials was there and I would match my dial up with his. And then there was a lever just below that and that was an automatic lever and you'd throw that lever and it would automatically engage the turret with the director up in the superstructure and then he controlled the movement of the guns going up and down and the movement of the uh, Stuart going back and forth and uh, they had the sights up there and they would shoot at planes. Now now other people have told me these five inch guns move very quickly they rock back and forth up and down is that is that accurate? Yes 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 and some Sometimes you would be in your seat and the director would just, he'd just be going back and forth and you'd just rocking and rolling. Did anybody, guys get knocked, get their heads knocked against the uh, the bulkheads? Uh, once happened? in a while. Once a while, yeah. Yeah, once in a while. Yeah, and the big thing is uh, guys getting their um, feet caught in the uh, well underneath the breech of the gun when they would pointed up, you know, and the breach would go down into the pit. Um, I remember my cousin on the cruiser Cleveland, he got his foot tore off from a five inch. So it, the breach would just, in effect, amputate the foot, cut it right off, crush yeah. it and cut, rip it right off. Yeah. Did that ever happen in your compartment? No, no. Did it happen aboard the ship that you recall? No, but I think if I'm not mistaken, we had a guy in one of the 16 inch tours that was he took a nap underneath the breech of a 16 inch gun and they elevated the gun and crushed him. Yeah, that, those 16 inches are gigantic sized guns. Oh, that's a terrible gun. Um, what was the ship's, the crew's attitude towards Admiral Halsey? Did they like him as a leader or no? Oh no, they loved Admiral Halsey. He was a tough old bird. Yeah, he was, he was quite a boy. Um, uh, uh, he was a good uh, Admiral. Uh, he always walked the decks at night, exercise. And we would be on gun watch and stand easy. We'd be outside of our gun deck, laying on the decks, trying to stay cool. I remember one night he come through there and he stepped on us. And uh, he just looked at us and says, sorry. And just kept going, but he was a good, good admiral. Now, also Admiral Spruance also was on the ship as yeah. fleet commander. Yeah, now, uh, Admiral Spruance was a commander of the. He had his flag on board the cruiser in Annapolis, and I remember the Indianapolis come alongside of us, and they transferred Spruance over to us, and he had his flag on the ship for a while. How did people? What was it, people's attitudes towards uh, Spruance? I don't remember much about Spruance. Uh, I do remember Captain Holden. He was a fine captain. Yeah, I want to ask about Holden. Uh, talk to me about Captain Holden, sir. Oh, he was a fine captain. He was the first skipper on this ship. And uh, and I'm telling everybody just loved that man. Why? Why, why did it like He was Holden? just a good skipper. He was kind. He was not um, overly, um, what was the word I wanted to use? He was not um, a strict disciplinarian. He was firm. He was, I, I remember one time I 
decided to hell with this Navy, I'm going home. So I went home and I was on leave. I was on liberty. But I got home and my dad says, what are you doing home? And I says, well, I'm on leave. And he says, you get your butt back. So I was 26 hours over leave. And old Captain Ho, he, he did a captain's mast on me when I got back. He gave me a $26 fine and gave me my Liberty card back and I went on Liberty the same night. So he was under <coughs> he was understanding of what it's like to be a young guy away from yeah. home in the Navy. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. He told me, he says, he says, uh, do you like the Navy? And I says, absolutely. And he says, well, then just straighten up. And I, and I was a good one there. It cost me the good conduct medal, but what the heck? He could have put you in a brig too. Oh yeah. Bread and water for a few days. Yep. Yep. It's now before we move on, is there anything else about your service aboard the ship that you think is important to talk about? Well, I was uh, <clears throat> I was on the, when I was in the fourth division. I uh, I had my duties as cleaning stations, as far as the swabbing the decks and. Uh, <clears throat> uh, steel wool and this and that and polish and this and that and uh, my cleaning station also was Admiral Halsey's head but I was also in charge of the fueling, refueling gear locker the 4th division and 5th division had that on either side of the ship and on the port side they, uh, you'd have your destroyers pull up with oh, maybe 50 yards of us, and we would get lines across, and then they would drag the uh, big oil lines across, and we would send them oil from our ship to keep their ship going. So I was in charge of that uh, filling gear, and that was all. That, that deck isn't even here now. Uh, they took the third deck out after the uh, superstructure, uh, the third superstructure is now a missile platform. Was that dangerous work with the lines going back and forth? Oh, yeah. The line snaps, it could cut your head off. It was un wasn't that so much. Uh, it was uh, the ships would part. And uh, when that happened, the, the lines would run out real quick. A deck and you'd uh, steel wool the combings on the... Uh, hatchway and he says you're to clean the toilet the sink and the shower i said okay so that was my cleaning station and i remember there was a, a marine that always stood guard over admiral halsey's uh, door to his bedroom and uh, uh that was right outside the head where i was cleaning that, that was, I don't know how long I was doing that, but that was my station. Did you ever run into the Admiral? I did, the head? yes. What, what, what happened? when you Well, when he come to the bathroom, I'd have to get out, you know, and, and uh, wait until he got through. And uh, we didn't converse, you know. He, he didn't know me from Adam, so. What was it? Uh, how did it feel standing next to a fleet admiral, perhaps the most famous fleet admiral during World War II? Pretty damned important. Yeah, I, uh, I really, I really admired that man. I really did. I remember one night we was getting, we were supposed to be engaging the enemy about four o'clock in the morning. It was a bombardment. I don't know whether it was Saipan or or Okinawa or what, just what it was. But uh, Admiral Halsey got on the horn and he gave us a speech and told us what we was going to do. And at old 400 in the morning and blah, 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 and carry on. And he says, now I want you to kill them Japs, kill them Japs, son of a bitches. And that's what, and then he would say, now you will have a prayer from the chaplain. <laughs> but that's the way he was, he just had no use for the Japs at all. Of course, he was from Guadalcanal area. 
and he's seen an awful lot there, so. And then uh, we, uh, off the uh, Lake Tee Golf, he sent us up on a wild goose chase after the Jap fleet, and uh, uh, it was just a decoy to draw us up north, and I remember that run. When we got back, why, the big main battle was almost over, and I think we did uh, finish off a Japanese cruiser that had already been wounded, pretty much. And I did see about, oh, 200 Japs, more or less, in the water, and debris hanging on from one of the ships that had been sunk. And uh, the Admiral gave an orders for the destroyers to, if they didn't get picked up, turn to 20 millimeters on them, and I guess they just cut them all to pieces in the water. Is that because they didn't want to be picked up? Yeah, they didn't want to be picked up. So they just didn't want them uh, spilling the beans to where the fleet was. And so, hey, George, how you doing? Hey, Adam. Long time we'll see. Yeah, long time. One of your friends from the ship. Yeah, he's one of the fourth division boys. Oh, good. Would you like to be interviewed, sir? Pardon? Would you like to do an interview, Sue? Oh, no, they're shooting. Oh no, they were. Ah, no, they George. Were. Well, we're just wrapping up here. Um, I'll join you. Okay. Have a seat right here. here. Sure, have a seat. Um, so, looking back on the war now, I ask the final question as we wrap up after thirty minutes. Um, how did your service aboard the battleship New Jersey affect your life? Well, I'm very proud of my service on this New Jersey. I'm very proud of it. You should see my bedroom. It is wall to wall pictures of everything, ships, my buddies, uh, countries. There's nothing on the walls. I mean, everything. My discharge, my medals. Everything's on their walls. Right, George? Right. Except for the good conduct medal. Yeah, except for the good conduct medal. What what would you what would you tell the young generation today, the young people growing up who are in middle school, high school today, what would you say to them about your I'm a firm believer in I think all boys and girls, both, should at least do a stint in the military service before they ever grow up. It's a good education. It trains them to learn a little responsibility. I don't see nothing wrong with going to the military before you go to college. It, it really brings you, it, it, it prepares you for life. Now, at this point, is there anything I should have asked that I hadn't asked that you think is important to talk about uh, for the historical record? Well, I I think that this is probably my last reunion. I'm I'm be 83 in January, and uh, chances are I I started back in I think 84 going to reunions, and uh, I think this is probably going to be my last because I've got a lot of problems. Physical problems, you Which know. If you're doing a great interview, that's important. That's okay. Important. Great interview. Somebody else is out there. Well, hey. sir, I think we'll let you go at this point. Thank um, you. Today, I've been interviewing Mr. Fred L. Adams, Jr. of Fishers, Indiana, who served aboard the battleship New Jersey from 1943 to 1946 as a deckhand and also as a uh, member of the Five Inch Gun Crew. My name is Dr. Tom Bennett. I'm from Kane University in the Battleship New Jersey Oral History Project. And today's date is September 19th, the year 2008. Uh, Mr. Adams, thanks so much for a great interview. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you.